Uh, no, I don't show much from the Ninpi Den, the Shoninki, the Bansen Shukai, which were all written in the 1600s. These are what they called ninja manuals. Um, it just doesn't apply nowadays. Most people that come to our school want effective self-defense. They want some sort of blueprint in life. They're not interested in how to make smoke bombs or how to infiltrate a castle. Although the ninjutsu stealth part, I do teach a little bit, but I haven't seen that or taught it for many, many years. Uh, the last time I learned about it was in the 1980s, uh, and I haven't seen much of it since. Very few people teach it. It's considered very unusual, uh, and I just don't have enough time. And again, people in the modern day, 2019, they don't care about that stuff. They don't care about the uh, ways of the ninja. They do like the philosophy, but they don't care about how to climb trees and, and uh, how to use the moon to your advantage. These, these are just not things that apply in, in America in the 21st century. So it's not that I don't know some things about them, but I don't see that as spending my time wisely. I would rather show someone how to defend themselves, how to use their voice, how to learn the law in the 21st century, how to teach a child how to be more confident, how to teach anti-bullying, how to teach stranger danger to a five-year-old. To me, that's more worth my time, and that's what we focus on, on in our school. Of course, we do study the weapons of the samurai and the ninja because weaponry has an important part in martial arts. But other than that, the other stuff I just kind of leave on the shelf. Uh, if people want to pick up those books, they're readily available on the internet. I tend to use my own music in our videos because YouTube is so such a stickler for copyright claims nowadays. So if you use anything of someone else's, you're going to get copyright claimed. Uh, so I use my own music. And ironically enough, I get copyright claimed on my own music. So once in a while, I'll get an uh, email from YouTube that says, your video has been flagged for music. And I have to write back uh, the complaint and... and say please look this over because I am the artist, I am the one that created the background music, I am the publisher, I am the writer, I'm the composer, I did it all. So please release my own music on our own video so that we don't get demonetized. That happens all the time. Uh, but it's just a bot. It's something that YouTube uses to catch, catch it. So it's not like it's a human being. Uh, and Every time that I do that, uh, our video gets cleared. So I try to use my own music. Usually the Japanese stuff that I've composed, uh, I've composed 32 albums of music over the years, and four of those are Japanese-based. They're called Taiken, T-A-I-K-E-N, and there are four of those albums, and they have about 40 or 50, maybe even 60 uh, Japanese percussive songs on there, all Japanese-based rhythm from taiko drums to shakuhachi flute to koto harp, uh, but in a very, very Western style, 4-4 four, four timing, uh, so that we understand it. Because I myself do not care for Japanese music very much. The time signature really is not uh, conducive to my listening style, so I don't like Japanese music in general. But So when I composed these, my goal in mind was to compose Japanese music that American minds would like, that we could train to, that we could exercise to, that we could uh, have a, a cadence and a rhythm, we could train to them, 4-4 four, four beat, like a, a backbeat, and that's what I always liked. So that was my goal with that music, and that's what we use often in our videos. Yeah, the stuff that you see on the internet from our particular school are very, very basic things. You're seeing little clips, little snippets of a class that might be an hour, an hour and a half long. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of advanced stuff because to show advanced stuff, especially with bojutsu and things like that, my audience, my students have to be very advanced. Many of the things you will see will be very basic in nature, uh, and we don't take into account the thousands of what-ifs scenarios that could happen. And that's why coming to class and physically being there, you learn so much more. You guys know you can't learn from watching a video, and of course anyone out there can pick apart a video, but if you're, 
if you're taking what you see out of context, it can look a little strange. And what you're seeing on the internet, including this here, is just snippets. It's not uh, someone's full opinion. And you're never going to see really advanced stuff. That I will save for seminars and people who want to put the effort in to get the basics down because you can't just show advanced stuff all the time because you don't understand what you're doing. You have to start with the basics and then your students, your audience works to, a, to the point where they get to the more uh, difficult stuff. But as far as Bojutsu sword stuff, you're only going to see some tertiary movements, but uh, I'm not going to show the secrets to the internet. Uh, I'm not going to show uh, 40 years of experience to people on the internet. I'm just going to reserve that for certain publications that I do, uh, certain private lessons that I teach, certain classes with certain students that have been here minimum 5, 10, 15 years with me. I am certainly not going to throw all my secrets out there for people to misinterpret and misuse and use for evil purposes or to, uh, to hurt people with. So I'm not going to show that stuff. Uh, on our regular school videos. No, I don't have a face or a body for, for movies, uh, so I would not be in a martial art movie, um, especially at my age. I'm too old now, uh, unless it was in some sort of a different type of role, but it certainly wouldn't be the action star. I, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, who do I watch? I tend to like old-style samurai movies from Japan because they the culture I love. Um, remember, we're at different age groups. So me being born in 1970, I was brought up in the 80s, late 70s, and even the 90s. So most people watching this video probably weren't even born yet. And those of us who are in our 40s, 50s, 60s, we know that. that this is an entire new generation or two below us that haven't experienced what we have. So they don't know who David Carradine is. They don't know anything about Bruce Lee or uh, Chuck Norris. They don't even know Steven Seagal at this point. Um, and certainly not Shoko Sugi, which was the stuff I liked, the cheesy 80 mo 80s movies. I loved that stuff. Uh, so I grew up with Shoko Sugi. He was my ninja hero, and I still to this day will sit there and watch one of his goofy ninja movies because that's what I grew up with. That's what I trained with at first. That's what inspired me to go into ninjutsu. Uh, Bruce Lee was a bit before my time and I don't think he's quite as good as people make him out to be, although I love his philosophy and stuff. Uh, but it's, you know, he's a movie star. Uh, I did, I do like how he mixed different styles, how he was open-minded. That was always attractive about him. Uh, he had a great TV persona. Um, Steven Seagal, I, I grew up with as well in the 90s. That was Aikido, although he did a different style of Aikido, which had some striking and kicks. And that was the first set of movies that I could say to my friends, hey, this is kind of what we do. It looks a lot similar. It's certainly not Chuck Norris Karate or something, but the, what Steve Seagal is doing in Out for Justice and and uh, all those initial first three movies he did, I was like, this is kind of what we do. They call that Koto Gaeshi, we call it Omote Gyaku, but th the principles are the same. And, and yeah, that Iriminage he does, we kind of do stuff like that. And the way he threw that guy, we, we kind of do stuff like that. That's kind of what we do. And my friends would be like, oh, so that's kind of what you do. It's like, yeah, finally, someone on screen is representing a little bit of what we do. Now, his later movies were garbage. Um, but... Jackie Chan, I like his stuff, although I never really get into that. I'm not as much into the Chinese martial arts, although I appreciate them. Uh, my parents grew up watching David Carradine and Kung Fu, and I certainly loved the philosophy in those. The fight scenes are garbage. Um, but what do you expect? That's what you get back then. Matter of fact, the other night I was just watching... Um, I tried to watch the movie Walking Tall about uh, Sheriff Buford, and it was like 1971 it was made, and I remember watching that movie with my father and loving it back then because it had some action in it. Um, Don Baker, I think, was the actor, something like that. And, and I, I, I rented it the other night, 
and I tried to watch it and I got through about 15 minutes and the first fight scene came on and it was so bad. There was zero choreography and you ever see a fight scene where the guy just sits there and waits for the punch and he gets hit and then he moves back and waits for the punch? It was that type of bad fight scene that I just couldn't sit through. And I got through about 20 minutes of this movie and I'm like, this is so dated, it's so bad, it's so stereotypical. I couldn't finish it. And I felt a little ashamed. I'm like, oh, I used to sit and watch this as a kid and, and now I can't even turn it on. It is so bad. Not just the fighting, the acting, the, the movie itself was bad. So any of you out there who can sit through that movie called Walking Tall, the old version, I think it was remade. Maybe The Rock did it, I'm not sure, but the old version was ugh, terrible. Uh, so I turned that off and watched YouTube or something else. Why bother training when I can play Fortnite for free? Everything in that sentence was so wrong. This is a problem um, with not all. You could never, never use the blanket statement, all of this, everyone does this, all people do that. Don't blanket statement stuff, but many people who are younger now um, are not very good, not all, but many, are not good at following through with what they say they're going to do. They have a real inability to be patient and to stick with things in order to become good at them. I know why this is. This is a sickness in society and I have suffered it myself. It is because we are so used to instant gratification. We don't know how to wait for things anymore. We don't know how to save money for things anymore. Uh, because of the internet, human evolution has not expected this to come so fast so in order to keep up with technology our brains are reprogramming themselves to the point where I expect to have things immediately and I don't have to do any work for anything I can go on Amazon right now and order things and have them delivered tomorrow so the idea of being patient and waiting and putting in the dirt time is unheard of with youth nowadays if you have a broken household that you are brought up with and you're, you either don't have the feminine or the masculine energy of a full familial group aspect, you are missing out on certain things. So when my mother would coddle me for certain things, my father would yell at me for certain things and say, no, get off your ass and get out and get a job. You need that toughness instilled in you or the earth, the world will eat you up. And I found many of the young people that I encounter, not just students of mine, but friends, and I get complaints all the time from parents that their children are, don't have the grit. They don't have the grit that they had. Now, you can't say all oh, because I know some young people that are wonderfully disciplined, that are capable of sticking with things, that do get their black belt and go beyond, that are highly intelligent and that are very strong, but I know a lot that are very, very weak. Uh, wallflowers, literally people that, that get offended no matter what you say. You can't say anything. Uh, they have to be perfectly politically correct every second or they get offended. And what they do is they shrivel into their safe space and then they call you terrible things that aren't true. And that's because they haven't had the grit. They haven't had the toughness. They haven't had to get knocked down 50 times. They haven't had the heartache in life and to know that you have to be disciplined, to know that you have to have a tough skin and a strong chin, to know that you're going to get knocked down in, in, in the world. And that has to do with many factors, but one of them is the internet, where you can sit in your little bubble of comfort and you never have to experience anything, you never have to debate anybody, you never have to have your beliefs questioned, you never have to get hit in the face, you never get thrown to the ground in a judo throw, you never pick up a sword, yet you think you're a master of one because you played Call of Duty or Fortnite. It's inexperienced people trying to think that they're experienced because they've experienced something through a 2D screen. So I watch something on YouTube or on television and I think I'm a master at it and I actually have no clue how to do it. I'll comment all day on what you're showing me because I'm a master. And I know it because I played Fortnite. I know about a 9mm gun. I know how to shoot it. I know how to hit that A button. 
But in reality, you throw them a pistol, they can't even rack the slide back because they have no hand strength. Or they don't know what the buttons mean. They don't know how to aim things in real life. They don't understand that when a, a bad guy is coming at you, you've got to miss five out of six shots. They don't know these things. So their knowledge is theoretical rather than experiential. And the first thing I need to do with my students, the young ones, is snap them out of that and say, no, this is tough, this is martial arts. And many of them quit. Many of them cannot handle the day-to-day -day rigorous training, which I don't find very rigorous, but they do, uh, because they're so used to sitting in their comfort zone. And just like a funnel, uh, you pour a bunch of people in and a couple will spit out the bottom. Those are the real ones that are tough. Those are the future leaders. Those are the ones who are going to become the next generation of sensei. They're the ones that we will be the future teachers of my martial art. And that's about right. There's about two out of 20 that will endure and persevere. The rest find it too difficult or they quit because they're not getting, um, you know, enough accolades, enough belts, enough, you know, attention paid to them. So what they do is they try something for a month and then they bounce and they dabble and they go on to something else. And that's a sad way to go through life because you never really get good at anything. You dabble in a bunch of things, but you never, you never become like an expert at anything. What you become is someone who's not trustworthy, someone who gives up easily and cannot commit to anything. And that happens with relationships, with everything. And the first thing as a, as a sensei, as a teacher, I do is I have to toughen my students up to make them know that the world will eat you up if you are not a tough person. You have compassion, of course, you have wisdom, but you have to learn how to take a punch. You have to learn how to fall down and get up. You have to learn how to take orders from people. You have to learn from people who are older. You have to learn how to respect people, how to be offended. Uh, how to have your beliefs challenged, how to ask the right questions in life. All this philosophy and stuff is very important in martial arts with younger people. It's, it's really a crisis nowadays. And when I do see someone who comes along who is just so well-rounded and uh, gets it, they get how life works, those are the people who really excel at martial arts because they stick with it and they don't quit. And that's the secret to success in life. Yeah, again, for someone to tell you what to do as far as what you want to study, don't listen to those people. Uh, if you want to study weapons, go for it. If you want to study the sword, go for it. That's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I saw a samurai sword when I was eight years old, and I had one by the time I was nine, a real sword. I started to learn from different teachers from Japan. I would travel all over. I would spend thousands of dollars on seminars about swords. I would go to Boston. I would drive two hours just to learn one move with the sword, um, study Chinese sword, Japanese sword, European sword, the German style, and I loved them all, but the Japanese sword was my favorite. We study with weapons because they make you a better martial artist. I do strongly and firmly believe from experience, if you don't train in weapons, you are short, you're selling yourself short and your martial art. If your martial art is not showing you weapons, it is not a deep martial art. Each martial art has a speciality, it has a purpose to it, and all of them are good in their own way. The Budo that I found was the only martial art that had everything I was looking for. It had everything. It had the striking, it had the kicking, it had the grappling, it had the ground fighting, it had joint manipulation, it had every weapon you could imagine. It had the mind science, it had the meditation along with it. It had strategy, it had principles, it had depth to it. So when I did Taekwondo and I got my black belt in Karate, they were good for kicking and striking, but they didn't have any joint manipulation. They didn't talk about going to the ground. They didn't talk about multiple opponents. And you would use these clunky nunchucks and stuff for weapons that weren't practical. Then I went into Judo, which was great for throws, but it didn't have the strikes and things. And Aikido was great for energy taking, but it didn't have the street reality I was looking for. Only ninjutsu was the only one that was badass, that had everything. It was like the whole stew. It wasn't just the flour, it wasn't the water, it wasn't the onions, it was everything. And as soon as I sipped that first bit of that, I was like, this is it. This is the one for me, and I've been pursuing it for 40-something years now. 
Having said that, where you live, you might only have one of those ingredients in the soup. You might only have a little Taekwondo school. And that's fine if you want to do sport competition. But you're not going to get good self-defense from it. Remember that. Every martial art has its purpose. I was just talking to a fighter, professional fighter in the Belader series, talking about how his martial art, which is MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, which is so powerful, so good for the ground, unmatchable on the ground. Yet he was telling me it has no self-defense worth to it, very little, because it doesn't teach you about uh, the guy with a knife coming at you, or it doesn't teach you about the awareness you need to have with multiple attackers, or what's happening behind the truck over there. What if a guy pulls out a, a nine millimeter? What do you do then? What do you do if you have three guys attacking you standing up? He's like, I'm used to going on the ground with my gi with bare feet on a nice mat and wrestling and rolling around and tapping people out. And he can tap me out. He can tap me out in less than a minute, easily. That's a speciality. But he doesn't like it if I poke his eye out or I kick him in the groin or I rip his hair out. Or if I use my weight to lay on top of him and I don't let him do that stuff that you see. He's, um, he's extremely good at ground fighting, but he doesn't have the practicality of self-defense. And he realizes this is a shortcoming in his martial art. And we have shortcomings in our martial art. All of them do. Believe me, I'm more aware of my weaknesses than anyone else. I'm my own worst critic, my own school's worst critic. That's why we're constantly adding new things and evolving our martial art. Believe it or not, I'm such a traditionalist that I know that you have to adapt your martial art. Most traditionalists would say, no, stick to the katas of the old men. Don't change anything. It's the way it's, it is in the scroll. Do not change the scroll. I'm like, bull crap. I'm changing that scroll in a second if it doesn't work out on the street. And there's such a thing. There's many forms of racism out there. And what happens is, is some people will see this happened when I was in Japan. Because a Japanese person is doing a technique, they think it's the way it should be. Or because the guy is Chinese, therefore he, he has more wisdom. This is a form of reverse racism, which I saw prevalent all over the place. Just because you look the part does not mean you know what you're doing. So if a guy is dressed up as a ninja and he's Japanese and he looks the part, or she, or he looks like a samurai, that doesn't mean his technique is good. Because when I was in Japan, I saw a lot of bad technique from Japanese people. I've been around long enough to see instantly within five seconds. No, that won't work. That will not work on the street. That's good. That's good. That's a good principle. That's crap right there. What you're teaching is crap. But the people, the foreigners are like, oh, but he's Japanese. It must work. So they take it back to their dojo and they train in this way. And all of a sudden a street thug comes along and is like, are you kidding me? And they punch him 10 times. The guy's knocked out. We can't assume because someone looks the part that they know what they're talking about. And I tell my students this all the time. Just because I'm 49 years old does not mean I know about the world. I make mistakes left and right. And don't call me the sensei because I'm the one that makes mistakes just as much as you guys do. I am on the journey with you. Let's work together. Let's find this stuff out together. Does this technique work? Does this classical technique work? Can we use swordsmanship uh, in modern day 21st century, or is it is it junk? And believe me, if I knew that I, if I didn't think I could apply this to my 21st century training, I would never pick a sword up. It would be a waste of my time. But people don't know that they see you with a sword and they think, oh, that's stupid. Why are you training with that? Because I want to get better. Because I don't want to be like you who knows nothing at home. And you haven't seen me when I went to the range last Friday for three hours and worked on firearms and pistols, and shotguns, and rifles, ARs, everything. You didn't see when we did knife training for three hours last month. All you saw was a sword. You didn't see that we used our cell phone as a self-defense tool two weeks ago, and next week we're using chopsticks as a self-defense tool. Everything is a weapon. That's a weapon. That's a weapon. This is a weapon. The camera's a weapon. The tripod's a weapon. Computer's a weapon. Ultimate weapon right here. Your voice is a weapon. To say that you can't learn, you shouldn't learn weaponry is an ignorant statement. And for those who say that, they clearly have no clue what they're talking about. They're what we call in the martial art business armchair warriors. And these are the people that have no recourse, no power, except to type comments about people and to try to rip down what they see. And we know that those people have no fighting experience whatsoever. 
You get them on the mat and you can tap them out and knock them out in 30 seconds because they're all talk. They don't know what they're doing. So bringing it back, what you see with a sword is a small fraction of what I teach and what we show and what I know. Just because someone looks the part does not mean that they know what they're talking about. There are just as many bad teachers in Japan as there are in America and every other country that wherever you live. Don't always listen to someone because they look the part. That's a very important thing I had to learn because in my 20s, I didn't care who it was, if he was Japanese or Chinese, he knew everything and I was so wrong, so wrong about that. That's like me dressing up as a cowboy, right? Because I look the part and being a master cowboy, even though I have no clue what I'm doing. I have no clue about the six shooters. I have no clue how to ride a horse yet because I wear a hat and I sit in a saddle that I know what I'm talking about. I don't. Um, so how do you tell when someone's an expert and someone isn't? You go to their school and you take classes with them. Because what you're seeing on the internet is less than a quarter of a percent. You're not seeing anything on the internet. You're seeing just a little piece. Talk to your teacher. Uh, the, the teachers that I respect the most are the ones that I spend time with and that, uh, that tell me the truth about things. They, they don't sugarcoat anything. They help me learn faster. They say, no, that's junk. Get rid of that. Uh, try this. And here's the reason. They're also open-minded and they're also students. They never call themselves a master. There's no such thing. Uh, so they're humble in that way. Those are the ones that I will follow, and I don't care what they look like. It has nothing to do with that, or what race they are, or their background, or what color their skin is, what sex they are. Who cares? If they are a good teacher, what they're saying, and more or less who they are, their character will come through. And I'll see it in their technique as well. I'll know when someone has been around for one year or 40 years. You can tell in five minutes how they move their feet, uh, how good someone is. So that's enough. I'm going to shut up on that because I'll go on and on and rant about it. So take what you will out of that. Discard the rest. It depends on your perception. My answer is no. It's just like every other country. There are parts of Japan that are beautiful, but you have to find them. Uh, it's just like anywhere else. There are beautiful parts of America, not so good parts. This is the problem with fantasy is if you've only seen movies which are not real, when you get to a place you will always be sorely disappointed because it will never live up to the expectations of the illusion of your mind. When I used to watch movies, samurai movies of old Japan, of course they would show the beauty of the mountains and all of the beautiful bamboo and the way people walked and, and the cherry blossom trees and the beautiful skies and you no know, you get to the downtown cities of like Kashiro where I was or Tokyo and it's just bumbling millions of people running around trying to get to work with no interest in martial arts no interest in in their ancient culture they're worried about what's on their cell phone and that's pretty much how most of it is and that's how it is now again it's like if you expected to go to wherever, uh, New Mexico, and, and learn about Clint Eastwood and how he was in Fistful of Dollars or Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, you're going to be sorely disappointed because people don't walk around like in the Old West anymore. They don't carry the six shooters. Um, there are places you can go, though. There are ranches. There are fantasy-type vacations you can take where you go and you sit at a ranch and you might dress up almost like a Westworld or something. Japan is no different. I sought out the Grand Master of the Ninja, so I had to go and get on a train from my city and travel a half an hour each way on, on the train and walk another two miles to get to his dojo. And then you would train for two hours with him or whatever teacher there was, and then you would walk two miles back to the station, get on the train, go back to your hotel. And that's what it was like for the, the nine days that I was there. Intense training, because what you would do is you would get up in the morning totally jet lagged. It's on the other side of the world where I am. So I was always 12 hours off and I would sleep in the day and then you'd be up all night. And strangely enough, the sun would rise at 3.50 in the morning over in Japan. Four o'clock in the morning, the sun is up. Land of the rising sun, right? So that's the first place you see the sun. So at four in the morning, there are like cars outside and the city's just bustling with activity. 
I was like, this is so strange. We don't even start to wake up in America till six or seven. So that was kind of a shock. Then you would travel on the train to go and train, and then you would train, you'd be exhausted. Uh, you would come back home, take a quick nap, shower, eat, go back. And you would do that twice a day. In some cases, even three times in the same day, you'd have two hour classes, four to six hours of training a day. That's a lot for anybody, any age. But you went there to train. I wasn't going to go there just to sightsee. I went there to train, so I did. Train with a bunch of people. Now, people are always asking me, what are the Shihan like over in Japan? Are they as cool as they look? Uh, yeah, but they're human beings just like anybody else. They make mistakes. Uh, again, what I said before, just because they're Japanese doesn't know that they mean that they know everything. And the really good teachers that I saw were the ones that admitted that and said, hey, I'm just a, a guy that learned from Hatsumi and I'm trying to teach you the way he showed me. Take this for what it's worth. Take this back to your dojo and pull it apart. Learn the secrets of it. I loved those teachers. Were all the teachers in Japan good? No. Nope, just like everywhere else, you had teachers who were egotistical. You had some teachers who were standoffish. That's not a good teacher to me because as a Westerner, I want my questions answered. I want to be able to approach the teacher and say, Sensei, uh, I, I'm doing this wrong. Can you please help me? And some of the teachers wouldn't even help. 99% did, but a couple didn't. But you get that everywhere. So don't expect some sort of <laughs> fantasy over there. It's just not the way it is. It's very real. And there was some stuff I saw that was very good and some stuff I saw that was so impractical, it would never work on the streets of America. Therefore, I didn't uh, completely disregard it, but I, I wouldn't teach it. Uh, I would get laughed at by my students. They would say, what is this crap you're teaching us? That wouldn't work on the street. I'd be out of that in a second. However, I respect the tradition. And when I went there, I knew I would see a lot of that. That's not to say it's wrong. It's just a different approach, a very traditional approach to the martial arts over there. But overall, a great experience. I would recommend it to anybody just to travel there to, to be, have that culture shock. Couple things uh, when I was there that shocked me. Um, it was unbelievably hot. We went last last summer when it was so hot, people were dying. Uh, the elderly were actually dying. It was well over 104 degrees every day, 100% humidity. It was just crazy hot, and it never rained once when I was there in nine days. Not once. Beating sun from day day up till night. Even at night, uh, the hotel. I was on the tenth floor, and the 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 walls of the hotel were hot. It was so hot outside. And in Japan, in this, these hotels, when you leave your room, the power goes off in your room. The key controls the power. When you walk into your hotel room, you plug your key in and the power comes on, the lights and the air conditioner. So if you left your room and took your key, the AC goes off. Well, you come back three, four hours later and it's 88 degrees in your room. And then the air conditioning was poorly made. It was an old hotel. The technology is not very good. So unlike America, where we're completely spoiled, everything's big, opulent, and our air conditioners are, you know, you can put it on 65 and it'll be 65 in 20 minutes. Over there, it never gets below 75 in your room. It's just too hot. And everything's very small, smaller people. So the bathroom, you could, couldn't move. You couldn't move. You had a a uh, small shower that you could step into uh, and then you had a sink in the toilet but there was no room no room the people were really helpful if you got lost and I did get lost a few times they would help you till the ends of the earth wonderfully helpful people most of them to the point where they would stop and be late for work to help you find your destination if you were lost because I, I was a couple times I couldn't find what I was looking for and they would a certain store I had to find and they would take me to that store and make sure I was okay. And even though we had a language barrier, you need to know about 10 to 20 Japanese phrases to get around. Another thing that amazed me was how many vending machines are there. Crazy, on every street corner there's a vending machine. And unlike America, they don't have sugar like we do. So if in the vending machine, unlike here, you have crap like Coke and Doritos and candy bars, nothing like that there. It's all healthy. It's all water, tea, coffee, even beer, uh, but no sugary snacks. Actually, most of the vending machines had no food in it. It was very hard to find things that were sugary. 
So forget about finding a Coke. And when you did find a Pepsi, which was unusual, it had 20% of the sugar in it that we have in America. So talk about a culture shock. I'm like, wow, it is true that in America they feed us this junk and we become addicted to sugar and stuff. Because over there, they don't care about sugar as much. It's a real treat. You could order a muffin over there, but it would have 10% of the sugar that it would have in America. And I was amazed because I read the Pepsi bottle. It said Pepsi. It looked like it. The can was half the size over here. And then you turn it around. It says sugar content. Eight grams. Over here it'd be 40 grams. So that's why they're so thin, most of them over there. Plus you have to walk everywhere. Uh, a lot of people have cars, but many don't. So it's always walking upstairs, walking to the train station, which could be three miles away or more. Uh, they're very into walking, so they're very healthy. They don't eat a lot of sugar. They eat great quality food. Nothing's processed there. Very few processed foods. Most of the food markets I went into had fresh food. Everything was green. Unlike America, where we hate vegetables, it was so culture shock for me. It was like, wow, this is why they live to be 95 and 100. We die at 65, and we're stuck with diabetes and stuff. They really understand how to culturally eat over in the Far East, in my opinion. And it really changed my eating habits uh, quite a bit. So that was cool. The trip alone was wonderful. Uh, heck of a long flight, 14 hours, but um, very expensive. If you want to go there, I recommend you go at least once. Experience the island. It was beautiful. Believe it or not, bamboo over there is like grass here. It's no big deal. Bamboo is everywhere. So again, unlike you're watching a Kill Boo movie or something, no, over there bamboo's a weed. It's, it's an invasive weed. It's everywhere. Where here, it's very exotic to see bamboo. Expect your, expect your dreams to be crushed. Expect your fantasies to be dispelled. And expect nothing what you expected. That was uh, one thing I learned about going to Japan. My advice to you would be listen to your heart and not always your brain. If you are afraid, that is natural. I think everyone who takes a risk is naturally afraid. Afraid of failure, embarrassment, shame, all these things that are very natural. But think of the most successful people in the world. They all take risks, they take chances, they know how short life is, and they realize that they have to carpe diem, they have to seize the day while it's still in them. You can do anything you want with your life. Don't let anyone tell you or limit you or hold you back from any dream that you want to accomplish, any goal. For me, since I can remember as long as I can remember, it was the martial arts. and. I still wake up in the morning privileged to be able to teach full time. I don't train occasionally. I don't have a training group. I have a full time school with hundreds of students and many that are off site as well and long distance students from different states. I am privileged to be called sensei or one who has walked before by others. You know how I feel about the word master. People call me that and I don't like it. It makes no sense to me. There is no such thing as mastery of the martial arts. You cannot be a master of martial arts. And to call yourself one is ignorant and egocentric. It's impossible to master the martial arts. And when you say you've mastered something, you have closed off any new learning, you have pushed your students away from you, and you have no longer become a student. You just think you're the best, you're at the top of the mountain, and there is no such thing. Don't let anyone take your dreams away from you. Fear is natural. To be afraid is to be human. Go look at old movies, black and white movies, and look hard at those actors and actresses and the producers and the directors and know that every single one of them is dead now. Morbid, yeah. All of the heroes of the past, read any historical book, any historical figure of any means, all gone. 
At once at the height and the prime of their powers, they had youth in them, they had vigor, they had excitement, they had passion, all dust now. What that does is it hyper-focuses you to take hold and, as I said, seize the day and not waste time thinking about what could be instead of doing the action it takes to do it. To think about something is good, to perceive it, and then to talk about it is even better, but it's useless if you don't follow through with the third secret, which is to do it. The action, that's how people become successful. That's how people do what they want in life. They don't run from responsibility, they run toward it. And if you feel like you don't have a sense of purpose in your life, you have to turn around and run toward that light and run toward that goal that you're thinking of right now. The fact that you asked me that question means you have fear and that's okay. That's healthy. But is it going to be so fearful that you're going to hold yourself back from accomplishing your goal? I'm here to tell you you can do it. I'm here to support you because there'll be many that won't. There'll be many that will want you to fail, the watchers in life, not the doers. And for those people who can't do something, what they do is they d decide to tear it down. That's their only means of power. That's their only means of communication. If I can't do it, I'll be damned if you will. I'm going to tear down what you're trying to do. The naysayers in life, the losers in life, the ones that end up living in the basement their whole life, never seeing the light of day and taking a chance on themselves. For goodness sake, honor your parents who put you in this world and do something and make them proud before they die too. And if you're lucky enough to still have grandparents, show off in front of them. Invite them to your martial art tournaments or whatever you do. And the type of martial art is important. Don't let anyone tell you differently. All of them are vehicles toward happiness. They're vehicles toward personal power. They're vehicles toward success. They're vehicles toward looking in who we are and finding our weaknesses. But some are mopeds and some are Teslas, and Budo is the Tesla of martial arts. It's the only one I found that can go zero to 107 seconds, and it never runs out of charges, and it never runs out of electricity, and the battery is huge. And I did martial arts that were like a little motorbike and a little moped with a small tank of gas, and after you got your black belt, they became boring, and they had nothing else to teach, and you could tell that these shallow martial arts, and I chose one that has so much depth, so much power, so much Tesla to it, that I can't possibly master this martial art. There are nine lineages. So if you're gonna choose, choose big. That's why most people quit after black belt, because their goal's not large enough. They said, I'm gonna get my black belt, and I say, good, but guess what? You're gonna quit right after black belt, and sure enough, what do they do? They quit right after black belt. Black belt just means you have the basics down. Now we can get to work on the deeper teachings. So set your goal high out there. Set your goal very high. Fail higher. Try higher. If you never get to the goal, it's okay, but you're going to get a heck of a lot farther than the guy that had his goal down here. So set your goal at 8th degree, ninth degree, 10th degree black belt. Then when you get your first degree black belt, you won't think about stopping and say, I have it now, I got that, let's move on to something else. Let's dabble and be good at nothing and a jack of nothing. You're going to continue to second degree and third degree because they're going to be small steps on this elevated goal of 10th degree. Think high, my friend. Think high and mighty. Life is short. Dream as big as you want, but you have to get off your ass and do it. And you can't quit when you fall down and you have a bad week and a bad month. Expect to have unbelievable amounts of pain, sadness, and bruises. But the strong will survive. And those are the ones who are going to continue on the legacy of Budo. Those are the ones who are going to be the next generation. And if you are younger than me, I challenge you. I challenge you to be the next generation of teachers. And I don't care what style you do, but find a good teacher, one that inspires you and one that will not hold you down, one that you can train with together. So that's my advice to you, young man. What are you going to do? If I was your father, I'd say stop talking and get up and do it. Get the education you need. Move to where you need to. Get five jobs if you need to and then get a sixth if you have to. And find and surround yourself with people who are like-minded, who are positive and successful. Get rid of the naysayers. Kill the past if you need to. Remember that line from Star Wars. And remember, if you fail, you can always go back to your family. They'll always be there for you. 
And if you don't have any blood family, create your own. Find good friends and family around that have like-minded people and, and stick with them. Let them be your clan, your ninja clan, your group and create a space for you like I have with our dojo that's positive and a place where no ego is allowed and no anger. We leave that stuff outside the door so we shut up and train. And yes, we fail. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we need to get better at this. Yes, we need to improve on that. But that's the goal is the activity of the training, not the talking about it, not the thinking about it, the actual physical doing it. And when you do something like that, you develop purpose, therefore responsibility, therefore happiness. That's my advice to you. Until next time, we'll see you soon, my friends. 2019 is upon us. I'm recording this while I have my yearly vacation, which is one week. We have one week off as we teach full time at our school. I finished the book. I finished the curriculum book, which is levels one through three. It is now, right now, being proofread by some of my black belts to find grammatical errors, spelling errors, inconsistencies, and they'll have it back next week. I will send it over to the printers. It's about 60 pages long. It is our entire modern day curriculum from white belt to black belt, and then we have several curriculum beyond that for second, third, fourth, fifth degree, etc. We also have an entire other curriculum of what we call the Classical Budo, which is based off of Bujin Khan martial arts, which is what I trained for decades in as well. And we're the only school I know of that has both modern and old style martial arts that we teach. Old style ninjutsu modern as well. That's a lot. We have a, a Bo Staff seminar in January coming up in a few weeks. I have secured my teacher, Arno, who's coming from Paris, France, to teach us in March. So you're all welcome to come to that. It's going to be an intense and good seminar. He's a great teacher. No holds barred, no BS teacher. The best kind. Doesn't sugarcoat anything. Uh, forces you out of your comfort zone. So he'll be here in March. Uh, he's always a great time to hang out with and learn from. And then we'll see what the rest of the year brings us. But we're always training every single day. And I haven't trained in six days and I can feel it. I can feel myself atrophying. I want to get back to the dojo, back to the mojo and back to the Tesla. I want to drive her again. And I want to uh, start actively training in two days. Two days from today will be the new year and we can start fresh. 2019, our 12th year of business, my 36th year in martial arts. And I ain't done yet. So will you join us? And if you can't come to our school, keep watching our videos, keep supporting us. Uh, I sent out, or we sent out, 15 DVDs this week. So we do have DVDs on eBay uh, and downloads that you can find if you are interested in this particular style of martial arts. But until next time, my friends, you guys have a great 2019. Don't let it be another year. Let it be your year. Create your own destiny. We'll see you soon.